one of the best friends I have on this earth. And I love him dearly. Very qualified to minister tonight. An anointed oracle of God. Would you welcome my friend, Brother Mike Williams. Let's do that unto the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. In the stilted language of King James is English. Job 22 and 12 says, Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. But Moffat's translation is more in tune with our times when it says simply, God is on top of everything. And indeed, He is. And the church said, Amen. Amen. And if he is, I ask, why then has he dwindled so in the minds of many modern men and women? If he is, then why have we seen the degree to which some have been emboldened in their evil? It stands as moot testimony to the fact that God has been diminished in not a few minds. He is more pygmy than Prometheus, more gnome than giant. Too deaf, they think, to hear their pleas. Too blind, they think, to see their plight. His arm too short, they think, to reach them. His heart too small, they think, to love and to understand them. The lifestyle of millions is silent witness to their view of God. Our out-of-orbit world systematically seeks to denigrate God. His name is blasphemed and profaned. His name is defied and denied and defamed. There is a conspiracy of darkness to put distance between man and his maker. And viewing him thusly from afar has contributed to our diminished concept of God. He can take charge of a funeral but not the festival of life. He can preside over a dead body but not a living soul. We'll turn to him in trouble but oftentimes not in triumph. Make room for him when our world collapses, but he can't elbow his way in when all is well. It's not just the maliciousness of the human spirit. It is our warped view of God. And I am convinced tonight that it's neither coincidence nor incurable, but rather I think it's one of the most basic principles of life. The most elementary among us can account for it. Our view of God is diminished. God becomes small in our sight because we are viewing Him from too far away. God has dwindled in our consciousness as we have moved farther from Him. He seems small when we are so far away. But if we will draw near and if if we will come close, we will see him like he really is. And like he really is, is on top of everything. Hallelujah. Sadly, our society has snuffed out its sacred fires. A hundred years ago, Samuel F. B. Morris, when he perfected the telegraph, sent his first message and it said, What hath God wrought? But in 1969, when Neil Armstrong first stepped on the moon, his first words were, It's one small step for man and one giant step 
for mankind. And men had managed to muscle God out of the equation. The reason that some people haven't come to Christ for salvation and that others of us live lives that are rife with despair. No victory, no joy, no excitement, no enthusiasm. The reason is the same for both. It's because we see God from too far away and He is diminished by the distance. The psalmist said, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But they that are far from Thee shall perish. And it is a good thing for me to draw near to God. Simon Peter felt obliged to argue with the Lord when he suggested that they row out into the deep in the early morning hours. But when the deck was covered with a draught of fish and Simon was clamoring over that pile of fish trying to get to Jesus, it was to say, depart from me because I am a sinner. He saw him up close when he was disillusioned and bent out of shape and out of sorts. Habakkuk went up and had a lot to say about the Lord and life. But as he came close and ascended the tower of faith into the eternal presence, his tomb changed. And he said, God is still in his holy temple. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters do the sea. Thomas was comfortable with his criticism of his fellow disciples. He said they were dreaming. They were imagining. They were trying to cover up for their own failure to follow Christ. He said, I will not believe except I thrust my hand into his wounds. He was bold in his unbelief. But when he came close and when he saw him close, he said, my Lord and my God, when Elisha's servant was withering at the sight of Syrians, the prophet's cry was just open his eyes and let him see. And when he drew near, he saw the flaming horsemen of heaven and the chariots of God standing guard over God's man. The highest thing that Job in his day could imagine was the stars. And so Job said that God is on top of the stars. To whom then, said Isaiah, will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto Him? Hast thou not known? Have you not heard? Have you not known from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth that it is He that sitteth on the circle of the earth? The Shah sat on the peacock throne. The Emperor Hirohito sat for a generation on the chrysanthemum throne. But I come to worship with you tonight a God who is on top of everything. Hallelujah. He sits on the circle of the earth. To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and behold who hath created these things. A fortnight ago, our papers were filled with color photographs of pictures taken by the Hubble telescope. And ecstatic scientists at NASA were beside themselves with joy. And they were marveling at man's ability to take pictures of stars. God made them. And He made them with the power of His Word. And Job said, all we've heard of him so far is a whisper. The nearest star is 26 trillion miles away. Our farthest star is 59 sextrillion miles away. There's a star called Antares that can swallow up 64 million suns the size of our own. There's a star called Epsilon that's 3,000 times greater in diameter. Has a, has a, has a capacity of, of a volume of 27 billion times as great as our sun. But I want you to understand tonight that 
when God got ready to claim credit for making the stars, he didn't use but five words. He said he made the stars also. Now, let's go on to something else, he said. I want to come to you tonight and preach to you a God who is on top of everything. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing. You might be under it tonight, but God is on top of it. Somebody shout yes. Imagine if you could. If you could walk the avenue of time into the past, every step is a thousand years. Your first step would take you to William the Conqueror. Your second step would take you to the birth of Christ. Your third step would take you to Helen of Troy. Your fourth step would take you to Abraham. If you went 130 steps at a thousand years a step, you've reached the Heidelberg man. If you go a quarter of a mile at a thousand years a step, according to the anthropologist, you have reached Europe's oldest stone elements. But if you went 250 miles at a thousand years a step, you would have just arrived at the earliest fossil organisms that man has discovered. And you know what? You still would not have contradicted a single word of Scripture because the Bible doesn't say the world ain't old. It just says in the beginning God made it. Ten words. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I want to ask you tonight rhetorically, how large does God loom in your life? Is He towering over your physical pain? Is He towering over your financial pressure? Is He towering over your emotional strain? If not, then you're viewing God from too far off because He's larger than all of it. I've got book, chapter, and verse that says God is on top of what? Say everything! God's on top of everything. Yeah. On Patmos, surrounded by the sights and sounds of death, John saw him, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps of the golden girdle, head and hair is white like wool, his eyes a flame of fire. His feet were as fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. His voice is a sound of many waters. He held in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What a burning pot of oil. What exile and loneliness could not do. That's make John fall dead. When he came close enough to Jesus Christ and saw him as it really is he fell like a dead man oh come let us sing unto the Lord let us make a joyful noise under the rock of our salvation let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms for the Lord is a great God he is a great king you gotta watch for the little words he is a great king above all gods he's on top of everything hallelujah 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 in his hand are the deep places of the earth hallelujah the seas are his and he made them and the street of the hills is also his. Oh, come let us worship and bow down and let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. I submit to you tonight a Savior that's not struggling with what you're struggling with. I submit to you a Savior that's not limping like you're limping. I submit to you a Savior who's not worried like you're worried. I submit to you a Savior who is never surprised like you're surprised. I submit a God who is on top of everything. 
Somebody shout yeah! Little man, everybody say that's us. us. Groveling in the dust of embarrassment presumes to measure God. We pronounce him pygmy. We see him small. You don't need a Bible to figure out God's great. You don't have to have a church or a preacher. Just one look in the mirror should deliver us from any deception of how great God is. If you're going to make a human body, you've got to have 58 pounds of oxygen and 50 quarts of water and 2 ounces of salt and 3 pounds of calcium and 24 pounds of carbon, some chlorine, some phosphorus, some fat, some iron, some false sulfur, and some glycerin. That's what the physiologists say you've got to have to make that ugly body you're in. But God did it with dust. And when he got finished with that one, he reached into the side of it and he pulled another one out. He's on top of everything. I said he's on top of everything. He's on top of everything. Next time your faith fails, just get a picture out. Look at your eyes that have a hundred million receptors in your ears with 24,000 vibrating fibers in them, 500 muscles and 200 bones and seven miles of nerve fiber and a heart beating 36 million times a year pumping 60,000 gallons of blood through 600,000 miles of vessels, veins and arteries. Just look at yourself. You don't need a Bible to know God is great. You just need a mirror. Somebody tell me, is he on top of it? So complex are we that a postage stamp sized piece of skin has three million cells in it and a yard of blood vessels and four yards of nerves and a hundred sweat glands and 15 oil glands and 25 nerve endings and the evolutionists want me to believe that I'm a product of the blind forces of nature it'd be easier for me to believe that Webster's unabridged dictionary came out of an explosion in a printing plant I'm going to tell you where I came from I came from a God who is on top of everything he rules, he reigns, he's supreme he has all power and no matter what you and I are experiencing tonight God is on top of it Come on, let's let the devil know what we think about God. He's greater than time. Stands astride the past and the future of two feet planted in two eternities. Micah pegged him properly when he said whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Hebrews said he was made not after the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. He stared down a band of unbelieving Jews that were heralding their heritage to Abraham. And he said before Abraham was, I am. (laughs) To him... Time is a perpetual present. Mary said, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. She had faith for the past. Martha said, I know he'll live in the resurrection. She had faith for the future. And he bopped their heads together. And he said, listen, I am the resurrection now. 
I'm on top of time. I'm on top of time. I live in a perpetual present. That's why the psalmist David said, God is our refuge. A very. I don't know how you can get more present than present, but he's very present. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore we fall apart, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried to the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled and the mountains shake for the swelling thereof. Skip to the next chapter. So oh, clap your hands up. Wait a minute, I'll tell you why. All you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Because the Lord most high is terrible. Watch this. He is a great God over all the earth. David said the reason we clap our hands and shout is that God is on top. God is on top of everything. He's over all the earth. He's greater than space. Thou search me and know me, O oh Lord. Thou knowest my down sitting. I got to rest, my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. And heart acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. Here he comes. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? He's bigger than space. If I ascend in the path up into heaven, hello, he's there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, he beat me there. I want you to know the trail of time can't push me far enough or fast enough to get me out of his reach. No matter when, no matter where, he's still on top of everything. He's greater than time. He's greater than space. Somebody said yes. Yes. Now this is not a doctrinal discourse. I know very little about eschatology and what I do know I'm not sure of, but I got a PhD in life. Revelation 12, 12. Woe to the inhabitants of earth. That's us. Say that's us. For the devil has come down with great wrath. Knowing that he has but a short time. It affords a frightening look at the face of the last days. The devil has come down. Everybody say the devil is closer to the church than he's ever been. Hell is rising to meet us, the Old Testament prophet said. We often quickly quote that passage and then we move on, but if you would oblige me from the scriptures of two testaments, we can flesh it out. I want you to consider just for a moment the ancient but riveting narrative of Jehoshaphat's victory, unlikely victory. In the second book of Chronicles, chapter 20, the Bible said it came to pass that the children of Moab, everybody say Moab, and the children of Ammon, say Ammon, and with them other besides, say other beside came against Jehoshaphat to battle now the Moabites he knew and the Ammonites he knew but it said there were some other beside There's a strange thing happening now. In the generation that you and I live, many of the things that we face and that we fight and that we contend with as apostolic believers, we know they've been around. Either ourselves or others have faced and fought them before. But now, since Satan has come down with lots of wrath and little time, we are confronted not only with the known enemies, but there are some others also that are hanging around us. Some unidentified spirits of evil and darkness. And it's not until verse 10 of chapter 20 that more information is forthcoming the Bible said the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and the children of Mount Seir if you look it up in the Hebrew Mount Seir means the hairy shaggy ones (laughs) 
So in these last daring days, we are meeting some enemies that we know and that are familiar to us. But we are also running in to some hairy, shaggy, unfamiliar, unknown spirits that we have not confronted before. But I'm not suggesting that we fold our tent and head for the house, but rather that we remember that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We've got a God that's on top of everything. I don't know if you're living in the same world I am, but I can't identify everything I feel and everything I face. But notwithstanding my ignorance, I have a God who yet remains on top of everything, whether I know it or not. Luke 10 said, it's an old scripture, Behold, I give you power, authority to tread upon scorpions, and over all the power, ability of the enemy, and there shall by no means anything harm you. I give you authority over the devil's ability. Sometimes we fight the familiar. Sometimes we war against things that we know. And sometimes we fight things that we do not understand. But we must always remember, for the fuller you started to quote it, Rejoice not against me, O thou mine enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the light of the Lord shall be upon me. I want to serve hell. Notice tonight that you can't put a sickness in my body. You can't put a confusion in my mind. You can't put a problem in my church that'll stop me from going on. I've got a God who is on top of everything. Let's praise Him. Are you facing something that you can't identify? God's on top of it. Paul ripped the covers off the brutal face of reality when he said, want to know how I'm doing? I'm, I'm in the book, 2 Corinthians 4. Paul said, I'll tell you how I'm doing. I'm troubled. I'm perplexed. I'm persecuted. And I'm cast down. He said, that's how I'm doing. Am I the only one here? That ever feels any of that? He said, if you want me to get a little more specific, I can. I got labors more abundant. Stripes above measure. Prisons more frequent. Deaths oft. I don't know how you die often, but he said he did. I got 39 stripes five times. I've been beaten with rods three times. They stoned me once. They shipwrecked me three times. I had a night and a day in the deep. I've been in journeyings often, in perils of water and wilderness and city and sea. I've been in perils of robbers and heathens and countrymen and false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. And he said, as if that's not enough, I got the care of the churches on me. Truth of the matter is that there are people in this audience tonight on both sides of the street. There are some people here and the waves are cresting in your life right now. The sun of accomplishment is at its zenith. Your heart's at high noon. But there are others in here who are reeling from the unrelenting pressure of a recalcitrant congregation. There are others in this place who are racked by pain, facing a future of uncertain tomorrows. There are others in this place who are haunted by the specter of having to make do with inadequate resources. And I want to tell you, if you're still standing tonight, whether you're in the first group or the final group, you're standing in the power of His might. Paul said, I am troubled. 
but I'm not distressed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm cast down, but I'm not destroyed. And you helped me understand that from J.B. Phillips about 25 years ago when you came to North Carolina and preached on, I may be knocked down, but I've never been knocked out. And why could Paul say that in spite of his distress and in spite of his perplex, perplexing, for in spite of his persecution and in spite of being knocked down, that he was still standing? Why? Because he said, I know in whom, not in what, but in whom I have believed. And I know that he is on top of Say it like this. Everything. Everything. Last night, sitting in the office, I said to Brother Cole, he, I said, tell me. I said, tell me how you reconcile preaching, faith, healing when you've got something wrong in your own body. You've been wanting somebody to ask that, haven't you? When you know that the healing guy goes to the doctor all the time and the prayer line guy's crippled. I watched R.E. Johnson hobble to a pulpit more than one time on a cane and hold a healing service and hundreds of people walk out healed. Billy Cole looked at me last night. He said, Mike, he said it was not until God gave me dominion over arthritis that I got it. I said, explain it to me. He said, does the Bible say that Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted? I said, it does. He said, it also says that he's a man of sorrows. What he takes away from you, he has in himself. Now I'm going to get personal here for a minute. The going greeting that I hear is how you're feeling. Help me now, Jesus. You don't know how many times I've wanted to say rotten, rugged, ragged, reeling, well nigh ruined. How about you? But that's not the question of consequence tonight. How I'm feeling is not what matters. If you want to hear me say it, I'll say it. I'm a sick man. And that's not a negative confession. It's a positive fact. But I'll tell you what else I am. I'm a sick man with a healing word to this convocation of called people. I want to rise and tell every man and woman in this house tonight that whether you or I are buried beneath the cares of this life, we serve a God who is on top of everything. You may be buried beneath disease, financial strain, stretched to the end of the emotional tether. Get up tonight. We're serving a God who remains on top. Shout it of everything. Clap your hands and praise Him. And you know what? Because of that, there's no white flags in our future. Drop me down at the gate of hell and I'll win the fight. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail 
against the church. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Hey, let's get honest here tonight. I'm preaching to people who walked in here with bowed backs and bent heads and spirits that were dragging the floor. Let's get up tonight and look the devil in the eye and tell him we're serving a God who is... On top of everything. Let's press the issue. Shut you. Joe. Job said, you can be seated. Job said, He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone. And mine hope hath he removed like a tree. He hath also kindled his wrath against me. He counteth me unto him as one of his enemies. His troops come together and raise up their way against me. They encamp round about my tabernacle. I'm preaching to somebody in this room tonight who feels like the devil and all of hell is camping out on your doorstep. Four o'clock this morning, awake, I laid for two hours in my bed, just convulsing under the presence of God for people in this place tonight. And we don't like to admit it, and we're afraid to say it, and it's not kosher, and it's not cool. Behind our wide grins, there's a lot of hurting hearts. I have a healing word to somebody in this room tonight. Our God is on top of it. Our God is on top of it. Your church problem, your physical problem, your family problem, your financial problem, your spiritual problem, your sin problem. We've got a God who is... Job said... He had put my brethren far from me. My acquaintance are barely estranged from me. My kin folks have failed. My familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house count me for a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. I called unto my servant. He gave me no answer, though I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife. There's probably a lot of us that can say that. Though I entreat him for the children's sake of my own body. Yea, young children despise me. I rose and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me. They whom I loved have turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and my flesh and I'm escaped for the skin of my teeth. That's a pretty pitiful plight for somebody to get in. But that's the same cat that said, but I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand in the last day upon this earth. And though after these skin worms destroy my body, in my flesh shall I see God. I'll tell you what God wants to happen in this place tonight. He wants every one of us to walk out of here with our heads held high and our shoulders squared and our spirits straight and look a world and a devil in the face and say, I may be under it, but my God is on In the Revelation, John saw some strange things in the end. But, but, but if you tried to draw a picture of what John saw from the way he described it, you'd, you'd make a mess. Rising from the pit, shapes of locusts, looked like horses, crowns of gold in their head. Had a face like a man, hair like a woman, teeth like a lion, breastplates of iron. Had wings like chariots and tails like scorpions. And John saw all of these evil, foreboding images that were ascending from the pit. And they were embodied during the time of tribulation. But like the Antichrist, even though they don't realize their embodiment until tribulation, their spirit is already at work in our day. Those strange, unknown, unfamiliar, hairy shaggy spirits Ammonites I know Moabites I know but now there are others also but don't despair because after John saw all those unseemly woeful beasts he turned and looked in the other direction and he said whoa look what I see over there 
an innumerable company who have overcome by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. I, I tell you what they did. They hooked on to a God that's on top of it all. Hallelujah. And even though sometimes they felt like they were buried beneath it, they had hold of a God who was above it all. Hallelujah. Psalm 2111 said that the enemy intended evil against us. And he imagined mischievous devices which he is not able to perform. He intends it and he imagines it, but he can't do it. He can think it up. He can stir the pot, but he can't bring it to pass. If the devil could kill us, we'd all be dead. Already. That, that bunch appeared one more time in the Bible in Ezekiel 35, Mount Seir, the hairy, shaggy. Ones, the unknowns, the unfamiliar spirits, the things that we face and can't even put a name on, can't figure it out, just scratch our heads and wonder what in the name of common sense is going on. What am I feeling? Why am I thinking this? Why am I feeling this? What's going on in me? What's been turned loose in me? Shaggy, hairy, unknown spirits. Ezekiel, God said, Thus saith the Lord God. I like that. <laughs> oh, Mount Seir. I am against thee. <laughs> you know, one of the greatest revelations I ever got is that God's not neutral. <laughs> He's not ambivalent about us. He is on our side. <laughs> And he is against whoever's against us. Now, can you get into that or what? He said, I'm against thee. And I will stretch forth my hand and I will smite thee. And I will make thee desolate. And I will lay thy cities waste. That thou may know that I am the Lord. The living Bible says it a little better. It says, behold, Mount Seir. I'm against you. And I will smash you with my fist. And utterly destroy you. And I will demolish your cities. And you shall know that I'm God. You know what? I couldn't identify that old shaggy hairy thing. But God knew its name. God had its number. And God said, I'm against it. I'm going to rise up against it. I'm going to bowl up my fist. And I'm going to smash it and destroy it and utterly lay it waste. I want you to shout, I'm under it. But God is on top of it. Just let it soak in. Nebuchadnezzar's in a blind rage at the very thought of three Hebrews ignoring his command to bow. And so he threatens to burn them and they mock him. And so he offers to play more music. And he says with a sneer, see when you look at him from too far away, he don't look very big. He's diminished by distance. Nebuchadnezzar says, who is that God that can deliver you out of my hands? 
innocent men are sacrificed, throwing Hebrew boys bound into the burning. But when old Nebuchadnezzar came close, the, sting, the king was astonished. And he said to his counselors, let's talk about this. Did not we cast three men bound into the fire? Lo, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire and they have no harm but he said the thing that's kind of eating at me is the form of the fourth man looks a whole lot like the son of God now when he saw him from afar he said who can deliver you out of my hand but when he saw him close up he made a decree that every people and every nation and every language that spake anything against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego would be cut in pieces and their houses turned into a dunghill. You just got to get up close where you can see that God is on top. Isn't that good? Yeah. Pharaoh looks into the stunned face of Moses. You got to understand. Moses had just heard a bush talk. Moses has just seen a rod run like a rattlesnake. His hand turned leprous and then like a baby's skin. And Pharaoh looks at him and says, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Moses can't believe his eyes. A few plagues later. Just got to creep up on him. Just got to see him close up. Israel's got their belly full of roasted lamb and bitter herbs. They got doors dripping with blood. And there's a death angel passing over every heathen house. And Pharaoh rose up in the middle of the night and called for Moses and said, Rise up, Moses, and get you forth from among my people and take you and your children and your flocks and your herds and go and serve your God. And then he put a P.S. on it. Moses was almost out of town. Pharaoh chased him down and said, And Moses, bless me also. Yeah. This is the cat that just said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And now he's trying to hold his head out to get Moses to lay his hand on it and bless him before he leaves town. I'm here to tell you, if you get up close to God and see him like he really is, you'll understand that he's on top of everything. He's on top of everything. He's on top of everything. He's on top. Stand to your feet. Lots of preaching left. Not much energy left. See, watch this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me. My heart will not fear. The war should rise against me. And this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple for in the time of trouble. See, behind those wide grins are hurting hearts. We're trying to figure out what went wrong. In the time of trouble... He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. But here it is. He shall set me up. Now I always knew he was on top of it. But I've been under it. 
But now he's going to set me up above mine enemies, round about me. And so he said, You know what's going to happen in this room just in a matter of moments? I don't know who you are, and I don't know where you are, but there's going to be somebody in this place who has been under it for so long. You came under here crawling, and you hear all this preaching and all this carrying on, and you don't more, more identify with it than who shot John. You're just trying to survive. You ain't even thought about thriving. But right here, in just a couple of minutes, Brother Cole, the Lord's going to lift up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I believe that's going to happen right here in this house tonight. God told me that was going to happen in this house tonight. God let me feel it happen in my own soul today. What's going to happen in somebody's heart tonight? When Charlton Heston was making the movie Ben-Hur for Cecil B. DeMille, they had to teach him how to drive a chariot. And so for weeks he worked at learning to drive a chariot. When it was almost time for production to start, Charlton Heston came to Cecil B. DeMille and he said, Mr. DeMille, he said, we got a problem. He said, I can drive the chariot but I don't think I can win the race. And Cecil B. DeMille, the producer, the guy on top of everything, he said, Mr. Heston, you just drive the chariot and I'll see to it you win the race. Come on, let it break in on us. He's on top of it. He's on top of it. You don't have to finish first. You just got to finish. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, I really do believe that something's fixing to happen in the spirit in this room. I really believe that. I really believe that. I really believe that. If we'll just let it, it will. If we'll just let it, it will. If we'll just let it, it will. You're under it, but he's over it. I'm under it, but he's on top of it. As we, as we move into the final moments of, of this worship tonight, I want you to take the hand of somebody you trust. Surely you're sitting next to somebody you love. Take the hand of somebody you trust and that you love. And raise that hand heavenward. Hold on just a minute. And I want us to pray like thunder. And here's what I want us to pray. I want you to understand that that guy sitting next to you and that gal sitting next to you is very much bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And they're under some things. They're fighting some things. They don't understand. They can't identify everything that's going on. But I want us to pray a prayer of faith for one another. That right here in this service, right now, that we get an understanding that God is on top of it. That God is on top of it. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Come on, let it build. Let it build. Let it build.